Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to this webinar on the future of adult social care. I'm Ashley Moore, Corporate Communications Manager here at SIPFA, and I will be moderating today's discussion. This is one of a series of webinars that SIPFA is hosting, where we're examining a range of issues for public finance professionals, many emanating from the current pandemic, as well as issues whose roots predate COVID, like the one we'll be discussing today. So today, as I said, we're going to be taking a look at adult social care. Reform in this area has been battered around for decades and remains one of the thorniest issues of the UK political landscape. COVID-19 has clearly highlighted weaknesses in the sector's resilience, and we at SIPFA strongly believe that it should act as a catalyst for reform. The shift in public perception of health and care services, which we have seen prominently in the headlines over the last few months, means there may never be a better time to consider what needs to be done to ensure the most vulnerable members of society are receiving the care that they need. Now, before I introduce our speakers, I want to remind everybody today that we do want this to be an interactive event and that this is an opportunity for you to put your questions and comments forward to our panel for them to respond to and discuss. You're able to submit a question via the chat box on the GoToWebinar dashboard you should have on your screen. Once the presentations have concluded, I will put those forward to our speakers. You can submit a question at any time. There is no need to wait until the end of the presentations. So to discuss this topic today, I'm delighted to introduce three fantastic speakers. We have Dr. Eleanor Roy, who is SIPFA's Health and Social Care Policy Manager, Ewan King, who is the Chief Executive of the Social Care Institute for Excellence, and Aileen Murphy, a Value for Money Director from the National Audit Office. And Aileen is going to be our first speaker today. Aileen has led the NAO's Value for Money work on local government since July of 2013. She has published reports to Parliament on financial sustainability of local authorities, most recently on the position of the sector in 2018 after eight years of funding reductions. She has also reported regularly on local economic growth and on devolution, as well as on the halting progress on integrating health and social care. Uh, the recent report she led on, titled The Interface Between Health and Social Care, highlighted that despite 20 years of trying, this key question in public policy still remains unresolved. So I'm going to hand over control now to Eileen. Aileen, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Ashley. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and uh, thanks for joining us for this uh, for this webinar. So um, just to explain, what I'm going to talk about um, is the results of our recent report, which was called Readying the Adult Social Care uh, Sector and the NHS for the Pandemic. And that took the story from uh, mid-March, from the point at which Sir Simon Stevens wrote to the NHS, um, to set out what they should do to get ready for, for the peak um, and also included uh, what happened as a result of the adult social care plan where, which was produced on the 15th of April. So this is this if you like is the story of the pandemic from um, from mid-March to mid-May. Now if the if this all works I should be able to move my slides on. There we go. Now the first thing I wanted to talk about was uh, obviously the pandemic uh, didn't um, uh, didn't happen to a sector, particularly local government, um, Muted. Uh, that was in robust financial health. We've been reporting since um, uh, since 2013 on the, the financial pressure on the local government sector. Now, this chart shows you what's happened to spending power uh, and shows you that the sector has been financially stretched for a decade. That's the middle line, the red line there showing the fall in spending power since 2010-11. Um, and as we reported in our last um, uh, discussion of financial sustainability, uh, the sector was financially weaker uh, in 2018 than it was when we last reported in 2014. Um, it's much more reliant on council tax and business rates that, than the, it has been previously. The top line there is, is council tax. And on the other side of the, the coin, so there's less money, but there's more to do. Uh, the ageing population, the demographic changes are all putting on service pressures, uh, as well as pressures in other areas like homelessness. So um, there's less money and there's more to do with it. And then suddenly uh, we have a huge crisis to deal with as well. Uh, so what's actually happened um, as a result of that letter of the 17th of March, which also included actions for social care as well, it wasn't primarily, it wasn't only just to NHS England. Well, the first thing that happened was uh, an infusion of extra resources. Um, local authorities got two tranches of 1.6 billion, um, the first via the adult social care formula, the second on a population basis, um, and then another 600 million for infection control um, in uh, it, adult social care providers. Um, 
so that's the first thing. So there was extra money uh, provided immediately. So there was no question that more money was needed. And I think that goes to show that what we've been saying on the adult social care side, which has seen reductions since 2010-11 of 3% overall, despite demographic pressures, <coughs> excuse me, that there wasn't enough money in the system. Um, secondly, the, the actions the NHS took, again, very, very fast, increasing capacity, uh, both the the, um, the creation of the Nightingale hospitals, uh, the taking over of, of beds in the private sector, uh, cutting elective work and discharging patients meant that, that um, the NHS was never overwhelmed. Uh, what, that, uh, what those actions were doing was um, uh, preparing enough capacity against the reasonable worst case scenario uh, as developed by SAGE, but without a lockdown. So at the peak of the pandemic, and you can see this in the report, at the peak of the pandemic, um, respiratory beds were never more than 50% full. So the NHS was not overwhelmed. Um, thirdly, though that meant patients being discharged from hospitals between mid-March and mid-April um, without being tested for COVID-19. Uh, for COVID Testing capacity as Public Health England said at the Public Accounts Committee session um, uh, was constrained, so therefore they prioritised it for the NHS. Uh, it's not known how many people had the virus when they were discharged, and at the height of the pandemic, 40% of care homes uh, had outbreaks, uh, over a thousand of them. Uh, MPs described that as an appalling error. Uh, testing for health and social care workers has been challenging to get enough um, enough testing in place. So uh, compared with the success there was with enough beds and enough respiratory support, um, uh, testing and PPE are the areas uh, where, um, uh, where we didn't manage to meet the challenge. So central procurement, um, what we really would have liked to have done is to have assessed against demand for PPE. We couldn't do that, but we looked at the model PPE requirement for items to the NHS, but only 50% of the requirement for gowns, eye protectors and aprons was met, and only a small proportion for PPE among social care providers. Moving on, um, looking at adult social care in particular, uh, the capacity tracker, which they put together very quickly, because one of the problems they had was that, uh, as we've commented in the past, uh, data, reliable data on the adult social care sector is, um, is hard to come by and is fragmentary. So they had to put the capacity tracker together very quickly, and that showed occupancy at, at 86, 90% in April and May. So again, care homes did have capacity, uh, but um, they're running at less at the moment, so spare capacity could mean a less income for uh, providers short term. So we may well be looking at a situation where adult social care providers are financially stretched, and that's made uh, more so for uh, domiciliary care providers who are coping with rising costs for PPE, which they haven't really had to deal with before, and increased workforce costs, both more agency staff and over time, and also fewer people actually asking for hours. Uh, provider organisations are talking about significant and rising costs, especially PPE, which could represent a threat to the financial stability of many providers. And CQC said that um, the, the sector as a whole, as a result of the pandemic, its resilience has fallen further. Um, just have a word or two about the money. That's, uh, that's, this chart shows you what, which types of councils got, got money in the two tranches. Uh, um, of course, it was more provided for the NHS as well, but the local government money was not baselined. Um, so therefore, we've got an issue about what happens next year post the spending review, um, because there's no guarantee that that extra 3.2 billion will be will be replicated. And another important point is it was spread across all service pressures, not just adult social care. Uh, provider organisations have cl complained that the money didn't get through to the front line. Uh, local authorities. There's a mixed picture about how much money has been passed on and how they've done it. Um, some places put through an uplift in, in early rates straight away. Others did um, uh, provided extra money, but only, uh, only if you identified what you were going to spend the money on. Others had emergency funds. So there was a variety of different approaches uh, taken to the extra money. Uh, so what's, I'll just start to sum up now. So what the pandemic highlighted uh, in particular, I think this is a really important point. Um, the onset of an emergency and emergency actions doesn't mean that long-standing uh, problems of a sector suddenly vanished or be instantly solved. So that difficulty that um, all governments of all stripes have had for the last 20 years in trying to uh, integrate adult social care and uh, health services locally, that was still there. So you were trying to deal with all these problems 
uh, at the same time as deal with an emergency as well. So the money that had been taken out of the sector, the issues with the workforce, uh, which we highlighted in our adult social care workforce report a couple of years ago, were still there. Um, and that make dealing with the pandemic more difficult and of course importantly are still there once we uh, once you come out of it. Um, it may well be the second point there that an effective response um, matters are beyond government control. International supply chains are not easy for a government to uh, um, to uh, to influence. Uh, the lack of money in both the NHS and local government, although the NHS has not seen the funding reductions that local government has had, but nevertheless both sectors are under financial pressure. And the last point is really important. The story is only half told, really. There's a lot of information about cost and performance yet to emerge. We don't know. Uh, for instance, um, how the £3.6 billion pounds has been spent. Uh, the department's monitoring that month by month, but we don't know the full story yet. We don't know what happened to the money that went down through CCGs for enhanced discharge, for instance, as well. So there's, there's a lot of the story still to be told yet. So the future, thinking to the future, what does adult social care need as a sector? Well, the first of all, and most important point, I think, is the Department of Health and Social Care should give adult social care parity of esteem uh, with the NHS, and it should have a voice at the top table of policy making um, and implementation. The second point, I think, is clarity and certainty over future funding for local authorities. We're promised a spending review uh, in the autumn. It's been delayed last year's was really just a one year rollover. We've still got a uh, major reform of the local government finance system hanging, delayed now until 21, 22. Uh, the less certainty and clarity you have, the poorer value for money you get, because it means that, that finance director colleagues um, in the sector are unable to plan for the future. Uh, for social care, we need a long-term costed plan for its future, which includes how uh, people will work collaboratively uh, at local level and also take into account workforce development because it's uh, policy responsibility for the workforce sits with the Department of Health and Social Care and they need to pick up on that. We need a strategy for much better data on what's happening in, in social care. There needs to be resources at local level for effective market management because markets are different in different places. We need a proper uh, and public understanding of what future demand is and what the role of um, unpaid care is, what the role the, the state will take and what, what the responsibility individuals have. And for provider fragility, again, different in different places, we need differentiated solutions. In some places it might be they need capital funds, in other places it might be different kinds of support. Um, and uh, we need to be able to develop responses that uh, are suitable for a, for a, a, a disaggregated um, uh, sector where you've got very, very large national chains, um, but you've got very small uh, niche players as well. And the solutions need to encompass all of that, not just concentrate on, say, the problems of the frail elderly, um, but also look at look at demand across the piece. So that was everything I had to say this morning. If you uh, if unmuted, uh, look at the report. Uh, there's a link there in the slides, which I, th I assume will be uh, will be circulated. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to uh, our upcoming work. We're doing more work on adult social care markets, which should be published uh, uh, just at the start of 2021. My colleagues are looking at PPE supply, looking at how well shielding. Uh, is being done as well. So we've got a lot of work uh, coming through from the annual, which hopefully will point out useful lessons from the pandemic. So thanks very much for listening and I'll pass back to Ashley at this point. Brilliant, thank you very much, Aileen. That was an excellent scene setter to kick off the conversation today. Um, our second speaker today is Ewan King. Ewan leads Sky's business development, marketing, research, consultancy, and communications functions. So this includes leading the Social Care Innovation Network and the organisation's programme of work in support of the Department of Health and Social Care's COVID-19 Adult Social Care Action Plan. Ewan sits on the National Advisory Group for the School of Social Care Research and the Centre for Health and Social Care Leadership at the University of Birmingham and until recently was engagement lead for the What Work Centre for Children's Social Care. So please do keep sending in your questions and I will hand over to Ewan. Hello, uh, thank you, Ashley, for that for that introduction. Um, almost forgotten key elements of my CV there, so it's really good to be reminded. Um, so yes, I'm Ewan King. Um, I'm from the charity, the Social Care Institute. Muted. Um, for those of you who don't know about Sky, we've been around for about 25 years, and we focus on evidence-based improvement to both adults and children's social care 
And Anash, as Ashley has just said, um, we've been doing a lot of work recently to support uh, the adult social care sector in particular to um, recover and plan for the future in relation to, to, to COVID-19. So what I'm going to do um, is um, describe for the next 10, 15 minutes um, some work we've been doing since early um, May on um, under the title of Beyond COVID on uh, the impact of COVID uh, on the sector and uh, the challenges and opportunities there are to reform adult social care and finally uh, to develop some recommendations for central government and for local authorities and their partners so that we can reform adult social care and put it in a better place uh, for the future. So we started this piece of work, um, as I said, back in, in, in May when actually the sector was um, really being exposed very badly to, to COVID-19 and it was becoming quite apparent at that time that social care was going to be hit very hard by the pandemic and that many people were going to unfortunately lose their lives. And we all know now um, that as a sector, social care has been devastatingly hit by, by COVID-19. Uh, um, so what we started to do was commission a series of essays and podcasts with um, sector leaders, but also people with lived experience and carers to get their views on what the impact of COVID was, was for them and what they saw as the impacts for the sector, um, to identify some of the barriers and challenges, many of which pre-exist or pre-date um, COVID-19 and identify ways forward. What, what we had in our mind when we were commissioning this piece of work is that the government is still committed to, um, to use its own words, fix social care with a new plan, long-term plan for social care to be published later in the autumn. So we had that firmly in mind when we were, when we were asking for these, um, for these podcast essays. And we finalised the piece of work through a roundtable which um, we ran in July and involved um, Helen Waitley, who's the Minister for State for, for Social Care. And we plan to, re to publish the report, bringing together all of the insights and ideas that people came up with um, in about two weeks' time. So the first um, issue we looked at was the impact of COVID. And Eileen has actually already eloquently described some of the, the problems that the, the, the sector encountered. Um, but I will highlight three further areas that I think are worth um, debate and discussion. Uh, this is a sector that, as Eileen has already highlighted, has been underfunded for a number of years and therefore um, was actually pretty poorly prepared for um, a crisis of this severity. Um, Eileen has covered some of the issues, um, the underfunding of the workforce, the fact that um, the sector um, had poor data, um, the fact that the supplies of PPE were, were, were actually inadequate to begin with and that some of the guidance was inadequate. But just to highlight one particular problem that we've um, heard about is that many care homes actually have very rundown uh, facilities, uh, very rundown housing stock. And actually, some of them are so small um, that they have almost no room uh, to isolate people who have fallen sick. So that made it incredibly difficult um, to stem the, the, the spread of the crisis. So that's just one example. We have very many old uh, buildings um, that are used as care homes and uh, any future strategy really needs to have a proper focus on improving the quality of the of the social care estate so the sector was pure, poorly prepared um, the other thing that became quite obvious uh, early on was that certain communities were disproportionately affected by by covid and i've picked out here a quote from adele harris who's the chief executive of MENCAP, who highlights the plight of adults, working age adults with learning disabilities, who have died in far higher numbers than people without learning disabilities. So you can see there that this is a, 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 a pandemic that is impacting very harshly on particular communities. But actually what it's done is shone a light on the uh, serious levels of inequality that already exist in society and social care has to play its part in the future in overcoming those inequalities. It's a fragmented section uh, sector as well. Um, over 20,000 registered providers, many unregistered providers on top of that. And we've already heard about the poor quality of data. And to be fair to government, 
the gaps in the data, the fact that the data isn't joined up makes it incredibly hard to plan uh, rapidly and comprehensively in relation to such a fast moving uh, pandemic. So data quality is something we need to address in the future. There was a slow response in some local areas to the crisis. So we heard from my colleague, Ozzy Stewart, who's a person um, with lived experience to access as a personal budget that he didn't hear from his council for three weeks um, at the height of the crisis. Uh, he found that very frightening and very isolating. And that wasn't, he wasn't by far, he wasn't an isolated case. But there were many positives that emerged from the crisis. Here are three that I would like to highlight. So people told us about the fact that many local authorities used this opportunity to actually reduce bureaucracy, to take away rules that got in the way of making funding decisions, uh, drawing up contracts with providers, but also in helping people access personal budgets and direct payments. So again, Ozzy, um, once he had been contacted by the council, was actually impressed by the way in which they remove the rules that usually um, govern how you use your direct payments. And he found this incredibly empowering and helpful. We've seen enormous amount of progress made in a very short period of time on digital technology. The entire social care workforce has moved uh, online within a very short period of time. But we've also seen um, at local level innovations, often low budget, low tech innovations, which have really been able to successfully connect people up um, to help reduce social isolation, to help people coordinate supplies and shopping and and support to to, to 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 isolated and vulnerable people so i think there's a real opportunity to build on those digital innovations we've seen in some places eventually maybe because of the severity of the crisis uh, a coming together of local authorities commissioners and providers and citizens to try and work together to identify problems so up in kirkley's in yorkshire we heard about an example of there being weekly zoom calls between citizens commissioners and providers to try and identify what the weekly concerns were and how we how we resolve those. So as I said earlier, there are many challenges that uh, um, face social care and many of those predate COVID-19 and if, in, if anything have only been exacerbated by, by the crisis. We still have a huge variability in quality and performance. And this quote from Simon Bottery of the King's Fund highlights just one area where you can have massive uh, gaps in uh, performance between different local authorities. And in fact, we did a study of all of the local authorities in Greater Manchester, and we found that actually, even when you controlled for, for deprivation and for funding, um, the gaps between uh, local authority performance could not be explained away really. So there is something about how we um, uh, reduce the, 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 the postcode lottery, which seems to be a common uh, occurrence in, in social care. Commissioning, I think uh, we heard from, from, from many stakeholders, has drifted um, away from its original purpose. It, its purpose was to be a strategic function that shaped the market and guided uh, the development of services and innovation towards the improvement of outcomes. What we're seeing instead is a very transactional approach to commissioning, which is much more focused on procurement and on uh, commissioning a narrow set of services rather than thinking about the whole person and what outcomes would most benefit them. There's been a lack of support for innovation. So there are very good innovations within social care and Sky has this innovation network and we know of 20 very, very uh, good local proven innovations. The trouble is they struggle to scale. They, tr they struggle to have the support and the funding they need to get over that initial hurdle and start to build and grow so that more people can benefit from them. So we need a national strategy for shaping and growing innovation in the sector. And we lack a clear plan for the workforce. Ona Smith, who is the Chief Executive of Skills for Care, highlights you know, just how complex this task is, but the fact that we haven't got a single joined up strategy for the workforce um, is really something we need to address. There's a people plan for the NHS, and I think we now need a plan for, for social care. Opportunities, there's an opportunity to talk about social care very differently. We have certainly uh, detected that there's a higher public awareness of social care, of the enormous resilience and professionalism within the sector. People are impressed with what they have seen in social care. It's now time to talk about social care in positive terms, not talk about it all the time as being a crisis last resort service. It's much better than that. And if we talk about it positively, I think it will attract funding more easily and the treasury will be, pick up uh, interest in, in funding the sector. We need a thriving and sustainable voluntary 
the community sector, I think they have many local community organizations have, have shown their true colors during the crisis, innovated, been available, reached out to those diverse and communities that are experiencing serious inequalities. And I think going back to commissioning, we need a strategy that shifts greater level of investment to local community organizations. Digital at scale, just reiterating the point I made earlier, there are huge opportunities to accelerate the use of technology, uh, artificial intelligence, assistive technology, bringing data sets together, predictive analytics. There's huge scope to transform care through digital technology. And people at the heart of decision making, what I mean here is co-production. I think what we saw in some of the most progressive local authorities is a willingness to talk to local people, to engage them in decisions, to actually design services with them. I think that should be something that is fundamental to the future plans for social care. So what kind of system do we want? We asked people to give us ideas, to give us suggestions, and these are some of the themes that emerge. People want local, uh, locally designed, locally commissioned, locally delivered care and support. That's what makes social care quite unique and quite special. There was generally a view that uh, incorporating or embodying social care into the NHS was not a good idea, but that could actually reduce the scope and the, uh, for, for, for care to be personalized and person-centered. We need to build on what we call a strengths-based or asset-based approach, which is about starting not with people's deficits and problems, but starting with their strengths, their social networks, the resources and community. Because if we build out from there, we're not only create a more affordable and sustainable sector, but a sector that's actually designed to support people's existing uh, networks and needs. Uh, Co-produced, I've mentioned already, I'm aware of the time, so I'll move, move on quickly. Innovations, I've said, are importantly uh, enabled to thrive within this new uh, reform system. Social work care and social workers pay and conditions improve. That's part of that long-term strategy for the workforce. And housing, I think often overlooked, but actually we need a joined up approach to social care and housing because housing will be an absolutely core element of how we provide care in the future. Yes, residential care will exist, but I'm not sure it will exist at the same level. We need extra care, we need supported living, we need shared living models, which allow more people to have choice and control over where they live and how they live. Devolved budgets, I mean, down to the lowest local level. Uh, level. I mean, I was interviewing actually um, Rob Whiteman from SIPFA, the Chief Executive of SIPFA, and he was very much of the view that eventually we need locally based, joined up budgets between health and social care that are controlled and decided upon with local citizens at the local level. We also need to increase the number of people who can access personal budgets and direct payments. We measure what matters. This should drive commission decisions and how we make services better. Start to measure services that improve well-being and independence, and not just service uh, uh, measuring outputs such as the, the amount of time people spend with, with someone or the amount of tasks that are completed. It has to be much more of an outcome focus. So nine priorities for reform. You'll see these um, written up in detail when we publish the report. Um, James Bullion, who's the president of ADAS at the moment, Association of Directors of Adult Social Services, he told, talks about the need for industrial level intervention here. This is not the time for half measures, the reforms need to be grand and ambitious. And part of that, and Eileen's already mentioned, is a need to actually decide on which way forward for funding and set out a timetable for, um, set, uh, for, for achieving that. Of course, there's need for short-term funding, particularly as we face further problems, I think, with COVID over the winter, but we do need a long-term funding uh, strategy. We need to shift towards prevention. We need a place-based approach, which is local, um, involves the voluntary sector, involves local authorities, involves the NHS, sharing in decision making. I've mentioned asset based approaches, and we need a different approach to commissioning, which is much more strategic and is about shifting resources towards prevention, innovation, and well being. Joined up workforce plan, one of those would be very welcome. Um, housing at the heart of reforms. And then I think we're going to um, fall into the old trap of, of not dealing with inequalities if it's not front and centre to our reform agenda. It needs to permeate every aspect of reform. Are we really being serious about this issue? Because I think we have to be. And pushing the boundaries of technology is the final uh, point. We set out in the report a number of recommendations uh, for the sector. I'm just going to pick out a couple here. I think there's a real need for us to look at the, the well-being and the psychological resilience of the sector. Uh, the NHS is already putting resources into supporting managers who are burning out, frontline staff who are very 
traumatised by what they've seen, we need to do something similar in adult social care. And I think we need to establish an innovation fund for adult social care. That one already exists and it's pretty successful in children's social care. What can we do in adult social care? And so also some priorities for local authorities here. I mean, I think it's absolutely um, essential that we find a way to keep the community spirit, the mutual aid approaches, the networked communities going beyond COVID because um, ultimately we do need communities to take part in supporting care and support. So I think if we can find ways to make the bridge between the sort of crisis we have now and having a long-term community involvement, we can find that way, find a way to do that. And I think in general, a more celebration of what we've achieved because it has been a very difficult period. We've got incredibly good examples of practice. Have a look at Sky's website. We've got a dedicated hub on COVID. There are many good examples of practice on there. So I'm aware of the time. So I am going to call an end to my um, presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Unmuted. Thank you very much, Ewan. I think it's absolutely fascinating to have some of those insights that are informed by that lived experience and the people who are exposed to the situation on the ground. So next up, we have Dr. Eleanor Roy, SIPFA's Health and Social Care Policy Manager. So Eleanor started her career in academia, completing a PhD and postdoctoral research in immunology and microbiology. In 2007, she joined the Welsh Parliament, applying her scientific rigour to the scrutiny of public finance and the evidence base behind all aspects of government finance policy. In 2014, she joined SIPFA on secondment as a research consultant, focusing on public finance policy across the devolved nations, and this was in the run-up to the Scottish independence referendum. So in 2018, she returned to SIPFA to lead on SIPFA's work in health and social care policy, with a particular interest in investment in prevention, social care funding reform and the integration of health and care. So thank you very much for all of the questions that you have submitted so far. Please do keep them coming. And in the meantime, I will hand over to Ellie. Thanks, Ashley, for what sounded like a very grand introduction. I hope I can now live up to it by successfully navigating the slides, but I wouldn't be surprised if I fail on that one. Um, First of all, I'd like to say thanks to both Aileen and Ewan for a very comprehensive coverage of Muted. during the pandemic and what the vision for social care might look like, and so making my task as the final speaker a lot easier. Um, we know that the social care sector was not in a very good place before coronavirus arrived, with the tragic consequences. I'm failing already on the slide. Um, and reform has been in the agenda for many years. Some would say with a lot of conversation and not much action. Um, to be fair, it's not an easy task. There are many challenges that need to be addressed and many proposals have been put forward and then subsequently shot down. Now, you'll see that the title of my talk was How to Fund a Problem Like Adult Social Care. Unfortunately, I don't have any hard and fast answers to that question. But what I do hope to do is to try to ensure that the right questions are asked when thinking about the development of a sustainable system going forward. So we've, we've held already that the sector was not in a great place um, before coronavirus. I work with the Institute for Government on the Performance Tracker in autumn last year showed that um, based on the data that's available. Again, we've already talked about some of the limitations around that. But the main finding for adult social care from that report was if the status quo is maintained, if there is no change to the system, then demand for publicly funded social care is likely to increase by around 11% over the next three to four years. And that would equate to an additional 20 billion to continue to provide the same scope and quality of care. Earlier this month, we published an update to this work we struggled even harder to find relevant data to base it on because much of the data that we would normally use is not being reported in the same way because of the urgency of responding to the pandemic. But what that quite clearly showed is that the social care sector was neither well prepared nor resilient enough to enable it to respond to the crisis. A decade of austerity, increasing demand, a lack of investment and workforce issues all meant that the sector was already on the back foot. So just to touch a little bit on the financial impact, Eileen's already 
come up some of that. Councils are facing extreme financial difficulties as a result of COVID, as well as the direct costs associated with the outbreak. They are also seeing significant loss of income from business rate, council tax, fees and charges. So they're not only facing a cash flow problem, but they are also longer term implications for their overall budget and service transformation and savings plans. Whilst there have been release from government, some 3.7 billion today, that has been provided for all services, not just those associated with social care. And so they're having to stretch that quite a long way. We've also seen councils administering the infection control fund that Aileen referred to, which is designed to help to support social care providers. Worth noting that councils are administering this, but they're not actually gaining anything from doing so. Um, and the fund itself has been quite widely criticised for being overly bureaucratic and quite restrictive in terms of how it can be used. Now, it's an understatement to say that we don't understand the full impact of the crisis and we probably won't for some time to come. It's going to take the mother of all reconciliations to try and figure out what the full financial impact will be. But the most recent data collected by the Ministry for Communities, Housing and Local Government suggests that for this financial year, the income loss will be around 6.5 billion and additional spend will be around 4.4 billion, all of which around 1.8 billion is attributable to adult social care. That looks at lost income and costs on councils alone. If you look a bit more widely, a report commissioned by the LGNA ADA suggested that the wider sector could face over 6.6 billion in extra costs by the end of September this year, and that around 3.3 billion of that might may well end up falling on councils. The worrying figure for me that's come out recently is that the ADAS budget survey this year found that only 4% of directors of adult social services are confident that their budgets are sufficient to meet statutory duties. 4%. This time last year, it was 35%, which some might say is not ideal, but 4% is actually, I think, that quite worrying. So, we have a number of asks. Sorry, my slides are delayed. I'm hoping you will catch up. No, I've gone the wrong way. Apologies. We think that COVID and the weaknesses that should build in the sector's resilience should act as a catalyst for the reform that we've been waiting for for years. We think it's essential that sufficient funding is provided to cover the, the costs and cut to social care and wider council services as a result of the pandemic. We think that reform should be financially sustainable, equitable and underpinned by a clear understanding of the many challenges involved in funding the social care sector. And until that reform solution can be implemented, which may take a number of years, it's essential that adequate funding is provided, not only to put the sector on a financially sustainable footing, but also to enable it to become more resilient and to withstand any future shocks should they arise. So, I said we need to, the system needs to be based on an understanding of the challenges, and there are many, and I don't have time to, be, to discuss all of them or even a few of them in any detail. But just, just to list a few, there's an issue around equity. Social care is not free at point of care like the NHS, it's means tested. Some people will require no care at all in their lifetime, whereas others may require quite significant levels of care. If they're classed as self-funders, that can result in quite catastrophic costs. A recent report by HUK suggested that last year alone over 5,000 people were classed as self-funders with depleted funds. That effectively means they had completely run down their assets as a result of paying for care costs. And that's a 37% increase on the previous year. There's also an issue around how care needs are classified, whether that be as health or as social care. So for example, if if you're unlucky enough to develop cancer, then care would be funded by 
NHS. However, if, if you go on to develop a, a condition like Alzheimer's, then your care classes of social care needs subject to a means test. So we think the differential is too sharp and that this suggests that social care should follow a pattern for which there should be an element of risk pooling, as is the case for the NHS or the insurance products for survivors. There are two linked challenges in terms of demand. The first is we're seeing increasing levels of demands that are having to be managed, and the second being that public funding historically has not kept pace with the negative demand. So we do have an aging population living longer with complex chronic conditions. Um, however, the increase in demand is not all about the elderly. Since 2015, the greatest increase in new requests for support have actually come from the working age population. Councils have done really well in developing strategies to assist them in managing demand. With around 25% of all savings in social care between 2010 and 2015 coming from efforts to manage demand. And while these have helped councils to survive austerity, after 10 years, these strategies really can't be pushed much further without doing damage elsewhere. Some additional funding has been provided on a fairly ad hoc basis. We've seen the Better Care Fund, the Social Care Key Set, and the Support Grant, but these are fairly short term measures, and to be honest, they, they're effectively paid down over the tracks of a long term program. We think investment decisions are crucial. When budgets are tight, there's a tendency to, to want to meet the immediate demand and meet the immediate need. But this squeezes out preventative investments, which would enable the sector to, to land on a more secure footing in the longer term. Actually, what happens is you just accelerate the next crisis, which needs yet another short term fix. And we are very keen to change the mindset around this approach to preventative investment. We need to encourage a look beyond the political cycle and, and measure the extent of preventative investment being made in social care and across the public sector. And more importantly, to look at the future obligations and risks that, that we would incur if we don't make this form of investment. And there's a link there to a report that we did last year with Public Health England on how to improve the evaluation in this area. Um, the work focuses on public health, but it can be applied across all public services and it enables public controls organisational boundaries so that prevention can be uh, considered in place. Both you and Aileen have spoken about you know, problems with the provider market. Most services are commissioned by councils, but provided by the private sector, and that this market has been in trouble for some time. We have seen um, an increase in cash terms spending on social care since 2014, and much of that goes to the provider market. However, in trying to manage cost and demand, councils have had to try and limit how much they pay for services, but at the same time, providers are being hit by increasing costs particularly in relation to staffing costs as a result of the national living wage. Self-funders typically pay more for their care than those in receipt of public funding, and providers tend to cross subsidise in this way. However, an increasing number of providers are going out of business or handed back contracts. Some are now focusing solely on services for self-funders and separating those services from those who receive public funding. And all of this can eventually lead to supply problems and risk a lack of investment in services focused on those in receipt of public funding. And finally, the market unaided cannot provide a solution for social care funding. Nowhere in the world does the private sector provide an insurance product for social care, because they cannot possibly predict the cost curve for the current market. Costs could be, for, could be 40 or 50 years into the future, and shifts in patterns of spending could occur during that time. So the private sector just cannot carry the risk of such aggregate shops, so there's a total market failure. In terms of reform, it's been on the agenda for decades now, and the timeline of reform today, you could say, has been along and bumpy road to nowhere. The next slide, when it appears, does not show. 
the full picture of the last 20 years. This is literally just the highlights reel. But since 1999, we've seen four major independent reviews and commissions, four green papers and major consultations, three white papers and three acts, which make provision for reform. There have been numerous reports by select committees and policy bodies making the case for urgent reform. And the result of all this effort and a small rainforest of policy papers is that there have been effectively no major changes. In 2017, the government committed to bring forward the Green Paper, which has become effectively the scarlet pimpernel of the policy world, which is three years later, we're still waiting for the proposal. Um, there's no shortage of ideas and models with missing is political decision on the way forward. For reform to be sustainable, consensus is absolutely essential. And what we've seen in recent years is a tendency to float policy ideas, which are then publicly shot down before they can be properly considered or developed. For example, we've all seen the, the headlines in the media in recent years on the zombie tax and the death tax. What is clear is that reform is needed and it will have to be paid for. So there have been no shortage of proposals. Some of them shown on the next slide. None of them are perfect, and most of them require further development. For many of them, the devil will be in the detail. I don't have time to be able to go through them, but that's guided to be intended to be a sort of waffle stop analysis. Um, some of them are focused on specifically addressing the equity issue, so cap and care costs, provision of key personal care, changing the parameters of the means test. None of these would raise any revenue, quite the opposite. They would put further burden on public costs, so they would have to be paired with some method of raising or redistributing revenue to those more in the social care court. Um, there's no getting away from the fact that more money is needed, whatever the mechanism, and it will come from the public purse. So we're going to have to pay for it, whether that be from redistribution of existing programmes, raising tax, or some form of insurance it's still effectively going to be our public money. The shift in public perception that's happened recently as a result of COVID um, means that there may never be a better time to address that issue, the relationship between the state and the individual, and to consider what the vision for a reform system might look like and how to pay for it. We don't recommend a given level of spending or a specific system. These are political decisions, but what we do is to propose five points which will hopefully guide the discussion around funding reform. There's a critical need to improve the long term financial sustainability of the sector. Um, we can achieve that by adjusting the level of funding or adjusting service expectations. That's a political and economic choice, but if we, make, if we don't make that choice, the position will be unsustainable. If there's no reduction in service, then we need enough headroom for investment in preventative measures. Some reallocation of resources would make sense, particularly when you consider about the largest areas of spend on those of retirement age. Um, pensions and took care and welfare benefits don't contribute to reducing long term demand in a way that other spending might. So while additional spend on social care is needed, it may be a matter of making choices within the existing spending envelope to a certain extent. Reform needs to address the issues of equity, seeking to pull risks and address intergenerational issues. And as I said earlier, there needs to be um, less of a steep differential between free appointment health healthcare and means tested social care. It's worth noting that although it's a separate issue, changes to overall local government funding arrangements will have an impact, we move towards incentivised um, revenue raising via property taxes with most the issue of relative need, and unless this is adjusted for adequately, the sustainability of social care could be fatal in the mind. And it's also worth, I'd just like to finish on a cautionary note, while we think COVID should be a catalyst for reform, it should definitely not be the driver of its design. The firm needs to provide the system of care that we want for the future, integrated, place-based and person-centred, which is sustainable and resilient to future shocks, not a system designed around the current crisis. Thanks very much. Unmuted. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ellie. And thank you to all of our speakers for your contribution today. There's been some really interesting food for thought throughout the conversation. There's been a huge number of, it's been a very vibrant Q&A going on in the questions box. So I'm going to try and get through as many of these as I can. Um, my, for anyone who's listening, if your questions aren't answered during this Q&A section, please do, and you're, you're interested in a further answer, please do feel free to drop us an email with your questions and I will try and follow up with the speakers after the event. So to kick off, hold that thought. Here we go. So to kick off, we have a question around diversity of finance. So the care sector has great diversity in how it's financed from charities like MHA, where I am a trustee, through to small privately operated and larger private equity backed groups. This crisis has further highlighted the financial fragility. Is there a need for greater financial resilience and regulation of the sector to ensure sustainability and legitimacy, including how shareholders act more in line with a public purpose? So who would like to come in on that one? Um, I'd be happy to take a punt at it. Yes, please do. Um, I think that's a that's a really good question, um, and I do do, we, do I think it needs better regulation um, and much sharper analysis of um, the financial structures that lie behind the big chains. Yes, I do. I think there is a real risk. I think the Treasury is right to be worried about this. That if you put more money into social care, it will just disappear into um, you know a slight raise in, in early rates, and it won't bring about the, uh, the the profound change that's actually needed. So yeah, a beefed up regulator, more powers for CQC, a lot more public transparency actually and uh, open book accounting and commitment from uh, people who um, are firms that, that contract with the, uh, with the public sector to apply principles which should be set out and agreed in advance. Any further thoughts on that question? I think Eileen has um, covered the bases quite admirably on that one. <laughs> I would okay. agree with pretty much everything she said. Excellent. In which case, we have a further question. Do we have any clue as to Boris's plan to sort out adult social care finance? That's a very short answer to that one. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> we don't. <laughs> Uh, and, and the delay, I, I don't know what, how long you think it's been, uh, Ellie, but I, I, I think we're getting on for over two years now since the, the first green slash white paper was commented. Is it not getting towards two and a half years? June 2017 was when the first commitment that I could find to the green paper. But I think during that right. time, it's kind of morphed and changed because mm -hmm. there was a lot of discussion about it would only provide for... Uh, elderly care and then it was opened yeah. up a little bit more widely but yeah I mean what, what we do know is that there's been a health and care task force established um, somewhere in the space between number 10 and the department I'm not entirely sure where in that space it falls um, and that the issue is being looked at um, other than what we've seen Quoted in the headlines in the last couple of weeks, we I certainly have no further insight. Okay, uh, we have another question. What do you think the Department for Health and Social Care's role in reform should be? What does the department need to do to ably lead the sector? Uh, which of us do you want to answer that one, Ashley? Um, Aileen, if you'd like to come in on that one first, we can probably go around the panel on that one. Yeah, um, the Department of Health and Social Care has policy responsibility for social care. So what I'd like to do, what I'd like to see them do is to step up and uh, uh, actually exercise that responsibility. So um, however they want to do it, they could look back at the last 20 years of commissions, etc. green papers, um, uh, all the way back to the Sutherland Commission and decide what the system should look like and an implementation plan of how to get there. Uh, that should include, as uh, Ewan has said, um, a workforce development plan as well because they have policy responsibility for that but the last strategy on that I think uh, from memory was 2007 um, so it's about all parts of the sector 
so we need to see what the national vision is and how that will be implemented locally. So I totally agree with the place-based approach that Sky uh, was setting out in that, absolutely, because I don't think you can, you can't commission social care from Whitehall, it, it just wouldn't work. But we do need to see that national leadership uh, as well. And if it needs legis legislative change, let's get on with it. I don't think so, because we've got the Care Act on the books and not all of it's been brought into force yet. Um, and and uh, it's wrapped up with a solution to what we do about local government finance. So they're big, difficult questions, but by not answering them, we're not getting any further forward. So it's about leadership and vision. Ewan, would you like to come in on that one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, in some ways, the, the way the government approached the Care Act wasn't the worst te template in history of policy making. I mean, I, I was... I was involved a bit in some of the committees that were set up to develop the guidance on the Care Act, and it was by the end quite cross-party. Um, it did have mm. quite a lot of people with lived experience involved. Um, it did have a lot of discussion with the sector. So, um, and it was quite well. Uh, it was quite well led at the time by by the ministers uh, responsible, and also by the. They had a very strong director general who who guided that process. They had a director general for social care, and that, they actually didn't have a director general for social care for a while in recent years, and it and it's shown. Um, so I think there's I something about they still don't have one at the moment. They did have one for about three weeks. Um, so oh. so yeah, so I think that's a real that's a real issue. I think they can galvanise. They can set out a vision. They can co-produce that vision with the sector. So they can do all of that. I think they also have a role in setting out expectations uh in in setting out standards in in setting out um their view that um on what a good care system looks like i think they can do more to encourage innovation as i said before um so i think there's a, there is a national a strong national role um that is needed ellie do you have anything to add i i, I would agree with 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 you know both you and and um, in there. I think the Care Act's a, a great, you know, it's not a bad piece of legislation. It would be nice if we could have all of it enacted. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't really address the issue of funding. You know, that was always going to come later. So I think we need to move, we need to move at pace on that. What I think I would like to see from the department is an increased recognition of their role and the importance of social care. I think COVID highlighted quite starkly that although you know we hear a lot about the interdependence of social care, uh, the NHS and social care, but that discussion generally manifests in terms of social care supporting the NHS to free up capacity. And I think during the coronavirus crisis, we've seen the quite tragic consequences of that. So I think that it's brought to the fore the fact that that interdependence is actually a two-way street and it's something that finance directors within the NHS itself have known for a very long time. They, mm. you know, they all come out and said when the long-term plan came out in 2019, almost every finance director I spoke to said, we can't do that unless social care is funded properly. So I think you know, both our other panelists are right, the department needs to take a strong role in developing the vision, having a national conversation around what social care we want, what do we want it to do, what do we want it to achieve. I personally think that how we treat our most vulnerable is, is a reflection on our society and therefore it's, it's a conversation that society needs to have. And the commitment to fund that vision has to come after. And it's not an easy conversation to have. There are not easy decisions to make. But if the avoidance of those decisions continues, then I, I really don't want to think about where we end up. Um, so, yeah, strong, strong leadership and commitment to take it forward, no matter how difficult the decisions involved may be. Thank you. I think we've probably got about time for two more quick questions. So we've got one here. Both Aileen and Ewan talked about the quality of data available and the increased use of tech on the front line. Is it worth thinking about funding for a back office enterprise resource planning system that captures and processes all the data across a local authority or IHSCP, which providers could also access? Ewan, do you want to come in on that one? Whatever that is, it sounded quite good, I must admit. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think 
I think what we still haven't got um, is uh, is a is a dashboard that enables us to understand what is happening in a local area um, in terms of people going in and out of different care settings, coming in and out of hospital, for example. Um, we don't um, readily link the data between um, those who are in the social care system and those who are in the health uh, care system, so that we can't get that 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 clear picture of the profile of of people um, and their needs and their and their and how we currently. So I think um, we've been long promised uh, patient records that are integrated and um, very clear to understand, and, and I don't think we're we're quite there yet. Great, and. I think well, this is an excellent question to end on. Maybe if uh, each of our panellists could uh, give their thoughts on this in a sort of whistle-stop manner. Uh, what will break the cycle of the numerous and ultimately unsuccessful attempts to reform social care? Ellie, do you want to kick off with that one? I think, I think the, the increased appreciation by the public at the moment, you know, they've seen, they've seen care home workers sleeping in tents on the lawns of residential homes to, to protect the residents. You know, they, they've seen things like that in the news, they've seen all the headlines, and I think the appreciation for the sector has, you know, multiplied exponentially over the last few months. And in the past, speaking to officials, part of the problem, if you like, of, of reform and social care is that they say there's just no public appetite for it. You know, if if your MP's mailbag isn't full of letters about social care reform, it's not something that's going to get attention. So I think the shift in public perception is, you know, a fantastic opportunity to take that forward and for public pressure then to come to bear to, to move the, the question forward. Excellent. Aileen, how about you? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with that, Ellie, uh, about the, the shift in public perception. I think the BBC's Alison Holt has done some excellent work in, in the highlighting the issues. Uh, for me, it comes down to um, uh, politicians, officials, both central and local um, members, having a genuine, uh, a genuine vision and genuine political bravery, because this will need to work cross-party. Um, consensus. You're never going to buy everybody in. But I think if you treat the, grown, uh, the public as grown-ups and you say, this is what we want to achieve, this will affect some people in this kind of way, then uh, people are perfectly able to make logical choices. And when you, you see the, the way that everybody reacted to the initial lockdown, I think that the public are grown-ups and they do understand um, that, that social care has to be funded. The question is the balance. Uh, between um, unpaid uh, taxpayer funding and um, your, your own personal resources, it's about getting that balance to a point where it's where it it has maybe not everybody on board, but enough enough people and enough move towards reform. Excellent. And you, and do you have any final concluding thoughts on that question? No, just um, just just to reiterate what I said during my slide presentation, we need to. We need to change the language and how we describe social care. It is something that we all benefit from. It is something that has makes a hugely positive contribution to society. But if we keep talking about it being a crisis service, a last resort service. I'm not sure anyone's going to to really get behind that kind of vision for a for a social care service. Brilliant. Thank you, Ewan. And I'm afraid that's where we have to wrap up. Thank you very much to all of our speakers for joining us today. And thank you to all of you who are listening. We've had an incredibly vibrant Q&A today, and I'm afraid we've uh, not been able to get to all of your questions. But if there are any that you'd like us to follow up on, please do drop us an email on media at sipfert.org, and I will look into getting some answers on those for you. This webinar will be circulated along with the slides and will be available on our YouTube channel shortly. So please do subscribe to watch it back or share with colleagues, as well as to access to all of our previous and future free webinars. We really hope that you found today's discussion interesting and informative, and we hope that you'll be joining us again for another webinar very soon. Bye for now.